Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Peterson Institute for International Economics. It's our pleasure today to host essentially a release meeting, but also a very important policy discussion of international monetary reform, what to do 50 years after the collapse of the Bretton Woods system. And we're honored genuinely to have four distinguished speakers today, including two editors of the special issue of the Oxford Review of Economic Policy. I believe our global audience online as well as in person is well familiar with Oxrep. It is one of the leading journals of serious analysis meeting policy needs. I read it and I recommend it. And in particular, I recommend this issue edited by Paolo Subacci and David Vines on international monetary reform. They brought together a truly global set of authors uh, to discuss this, to bring in multiple points of view, but all analytically grounded. And this is, of course, I don't know what image you want to say, the wheel that keeps on turning, the Sisyphean boulder that keeps coming down. As we recognized uh, a couple of weeks ago with our own conference on 50 years of flexible exchange rates, you know, the world has changed. Um, and the attention paid to the monetary system and the exchange rate arrangements and, of course, the role of the IMF and the various multilateral organizations keeps evolving. Um, but interestingly, the perhaps out of frustration, perhaps out of calm, I don't know, the attention being paid is less. And so while we started a conversation, we hope, with our conference uh, led by Doug Irwin and Maury Obsfeld, the in-depth papers and broad range of views represented in this special issue of Oxrep, I think, is well worth everyone's attention. And so we like to highlight this as the journal artwork comes out and as this adjoins the, obviously, the G7, G20, IMF World Bank meetings. We have four speakers today. Um, let me introduce them in alphabetical order, but just to note, David Vines, one of the two co-editors, will be chairing the panel. Um, first speaking, or excuse me, first alphabetically is Chati Basri. Uh, Professor Basri teaches in the Faculty of Economics at the University of Indonesia and served as Indonesian Minister of Finance in the second United Indonesia Cabinet between May 2013 and October 2014. He's always, he has been previously Sherpa to the President of Indonesia for the G20 meetings. And before his appointment as Minister of Finance, he was Chair of the Indonesian Investment Coordinating Board. This is our pleasure to have Didi Basri back uh, in short order. Uh, he spoke at our conference a couple weeks ago and at our Next Step conference in Singapore. He is one of the important voices, um, not just in Indonesia and ASEAN, but globally on these issues. Next, alphabetically, is Jonathan Austri. Uh, Jonathan is a longtime colleague of many of ours, part of the intellectual mainstay of the IMF for many years, if not decades. Um, he is now professor of the practice in the Department of Economics at Georgetown and a non-resident research fellow at Bruegel, our friend, close partner think tank in Europe. Uh, prior to his appointment at Georgetown, he served in a number of senior positions at the IMF, including as acting director of the Asia Pacific Department and as leader on a number of works on inequality and growth, as well as monetary topics and macro topics as deputy director of the research department. Paolo Subacci, uh, who is the other co-editor of, of this special issue of Oxrep, is Professor of International Economics and Chair of the Advisory Board at the Global Policy Institute at Queen Mary, University of London. Um, she's also Adjunct Professor at the University of Bologna. I got to know her when she was Director of International Economics Research at the Royal Institute of International Affairs in London, Chatham House, between 2004 and 2017. She is a noted voice in the inter as you would expect in the interstices between foreign policy and economic policy, as well as European debates. And we, this is first time in a long while we've had Paula, and we're grateful to have her back. And finally, again, chairing the panel is David Vines. Um, David Vines has a very long CV that he asked me not to talk about. Um, I, I will just say that while I was serving at the Bank of England, I found his voice um, both publicly and in direct conversation about substantive policy issues to be invaluable. Um, he is Emeritus Professor of Economics and Emeritus Fellow of Balliol College at the University of Oxford and 
Between 2008 and 12, he was scientific director of the European Commission's Framework 7 PEGD research program, um, which was quite an acronym, but it examined the politics and economics of global economic governance, hence PEGD, I guess. Um, he has been, a, for many years, a regular visiting fellow at the Crawford School of Public Policy at ANU, um, but also he's been a contributor, editor at Oxrep and other leading policy journals for a long time. So again, today's conference, today's event is about international monetary reform, what to do 50 years after the collapse of the Bretton Woods system. Let me invite our four speakers up to the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Adam, for your welcome. And that's not moving. There it is. Brilliant. There we are. And there is the issue of the journal that we're launching. Um, before I say anything else, I would very much like to thank Adam and others at the Peterson Institute for inviting us to come and launch this issue of the journal here. It's a great pleasure to be able to do that. As you can see from the front and back cover, we have assembled a large group of people, 20 of us, from, as Adam says, all around the world to issue, uh, to put together our discussion on these issues and it's been a very great privilege to bring together uh, all of these people. The journal was launched, this issue, online three days ago. There at the bottom is the link, uh, but you can just put in the relevant words in Google and it will bring up this issue of the journal. Uh, <clears throat> all the articles are free online for about a week. Then some of you will uh, be at universities which continue to have free access and others of you will face a paywall. And so if, I, I'd advise you to all get it in and have a look at it quickly. That's us and Adam has welcomed us all here. So let me cut to the chase straight away. Um, following the GFC in 2007-8, leaders of the G20 agreed to promote strong, sustainable, balanced and inclusive growth. And for a few years, many of us thought that the GT, G20 was only really going, was really going to be able to do this. And the G20 map opened a promise of uh, possible opportunity. Sadly, 10 years later, a promise not really fulfilled and it was in light of that disappointment that we set about asking how to do what the G20 really had wanted to do then. And there's a list of questions. Um, the first, of course, is uh, institutional and structural change to the international financial system. But then there's a co cooperation, leadership, the role of the IFIs, in particular the fund and the bank, and how leadership is to be shared amongst the different potential leading players, U US, Europe, China, and others. And as we keep on reminding ourselves, and I do as a, someone originally from Australia, uh, a country that you might indeed describe as an innocent bystander, there's a, there's a need for the second tier players to be confident in the way the system works as well. I'd, I'd recommend uh, those of you short of time to look at the first issue, first paper in which pa Paola bring together uh, the insights that we've got from this really large team of players. Uh, and, and, and there it is with its title, which is about what can we learn from Bretton Woods. So that's where we begin. And for me, this beginning goes right back to the time when I was a young postdoc in Oxford, 
working with James Mead. I will never forget the conversation sitting in my room in Cambridge in which he describes the chaotic discussions in the early 1940s after Keynes had issued his uh, call for an international currency union and indeed Harry Dexter White had uh, stepped up to issue a similar but different set of plans uh, from across the Atlantic. And one day at a particularly boring meeting of the Board of Trade, Keynes turned to Mead, scribbled on a piece of paper and said, actually now I understand how this thing is meant to work. And I write down there what it was that was on this piece of paper because those three things there are still the things that we are all aiming to achieve. An adequate level of global aggregate demand to avoid inflation, that's a levels point. Um, a, a process of international adjustment when there are current account imbalances, if you like, that's a sideways point. And then uh, thirdly, a system of international lending that is addresses the need both for adjustment finance while adjustment is happening, but also longer term financing of FDI <clears throat> and, uh, and the kind of development issues that Dede in Indonesia has been spending his life dealing with. What do we do in pursuing these uh, objectives in the search for an answer to the G20's question that it's put in front of us. First of all, some, some history uh, provoked by the really rather wonderful conference that Adam referred to at, at the beginning in his remarks. Uh, what Adam didn't say was that although these discussions uh, began about how to fix after Bretton Woods right back in the 1970s, there are still alive people who were there. And it was wonderful in that first session to hear those people talking about that. The, com the discussions in the Committee of 20 were very confused. And we have a marvelous paper in our Oxrep issue by Barry Eichen Green about why they were confused and what a mess the discussions were. No agreed new exchange rate system, no more uh, process in getting symmetry of adjustment, still a mess on global liquidity and no real clue about what to do about the SDR. And Barry, um, I think, rather oddly ends up saying what a disappointment this was, but never really tells us why, as author, he's disappeared, disappointed with the mess that they were in. And that set Paula and me to write a follow-up response paper and, and my view was actually, it's understandable they didn't know what they were doing because they didn't know what they were doing. You can't reform something until you know how to fix it. And we've written a whole paper on essentially these two ideas that you can't do a floating exchange rate regime until you've got a nominal anchor in place. And guess what? The world took 20 years to invent inflation targeting. So it's no wonder that it was a shambles for 20 years. And, <clears throat> I, th and I think that rather simple piece of history of economic thought is actually quite important in thinking about this history. Uh, what we've also been fortunate to have in this issue of Oxrep is a paper about why so many in Europe took the opposite view. Uh, there they understood, although however muddled they were in the Committee of 20, that they were doing floating. And Europe was full of people who said, no way, we're not doing floating. And there's a very good discussion in this issue of Oxrep of how and why those conversations worked the way they did. And, and I should immediately say that this historical paper in the Oxrep issue provides very thoughtful background to the equally thoughtful paper by Klaus Regling on Europe's role in the global system now 
And we're very lucky, fortunate to have Klaus with us in the room here today. Uh, thank you for being here and, and for your paper, Klaus. Uh, so, end of history, uh, looking forward, what do we think the challenges are? Um, we, we think that there are, you would imagine there are four of us, so we might split it in two. Two of us are going to talk about challenges for advanced countries, Bala and me, and uh, to Dede, uh, <coughs> Basri, and Jonathan Ostry will talk about challenges for emerging market economies. And down the road at, at the fund in these spring meetings, there's been much discussion about actually how these two sets of challenges are importantly tied together in a global challenge. Um, let me now, and you can see my role is just, not, not just, is to talk about content as well as framework. So let me give you a little more about framework and then say one last thing about content before uh, uh, <coughs> passing over to the other speakers. The, 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 the content point that I want to make is the following. Um, if we're talking advanced countries, then what is the issue that we face going forward with the international financial system? Well, Paola and I thought that this is partly an empirical question, uh, so we better get hold of Warwick McKibben and his G cubed model to do some numbers for us. And there is a really very good paper in the issue about how the world faces demographic transition, productivity growth issues, and the need for investment to get to net zero in carbon emissions by wrong date, 2050, says uh, two, two years, how, <laughs> yesterday. We won't get to zero emissions by yesterday, no way. Um, and, uh, but, but a little bit of accounting suggests that if you're going to face very large, no, I should say one more thing. These are going to be asymmetric shocks as well as large ones. And because they're asymmetric, they will cause very large current account require deficit and surplus requirements. And, um, and, and the flows of capital are likely to be not only large, but unless the system is well managed, volatile and crisis prone. Um, just look at them in a little bit of detail. Um, productivity shocks are likely to move meet, to movements in trade and capital flows of very many point, percentage points of GDP be, between economies. Well, we could do anti-globalization and, and resist these flow, throw, uh, either by protectionist in trade policy or by not having a properly functioning international system. And if we did, the, we, we would reduce welfare gains to the world very significantly. And um, it, this isn't a good idea. I'm just ramming home that point about that shock. And enabling these points to be rammed home with the right movements in current accounts requires a large number of reforms and accommodation of these movements. And as we look back over the world, a very brief remark, there were big movements in current accounts required immediately after the Second War. And of course, then there was a Marshall Plan. And there were uh, institutionally managed international capital flows. Now we face no national plan and much requirement on the private sector, big challenge. The demographic transition is likely to be also very significant. Think Africa and population growth. Think needs for capital where the world's population is growing. Think more current account imbalances. And, and, and of course, climate transition paths are going to be uh, requiring resource flows, largely to emerging market economies. But, but as an Australian, I have a hope for a picture of my country full of solar panels all across the north of Australia. Well, just think of the 
current account requirements first to import the materials to do that, and secondly, to sell all this electricity to Indonesia and, 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 and Singapore. Um, these are big deal issues. That's my point about content. Now I just go back to saying a little bit more about framework of what we're saying before handing over. Um, Paolo is going to talk about leadership issues in relation to these large flows that I've described. Um, Dede, uh, as I know, Chatib Basri always is Dede, will be speaking, as will Jonathan, about emerging market uh, economies, um, managing capital flows, the very important question of how these capital flows should be managed and whether unmanaged international capital flows are a good idea or a bad idea. I won't say any more now, I'll leave it to them. But I want to just close by drawing attention to two papers in the issue of Oxrep which aren't being discussed but are important and draw your attention to them. And these are about the global safe financial safety net. We know that the COVID shock has left death distress in many emerging market and the world's poorest emerging market economies and the world's poorest economies. As a result of this debt distress, uh, there's going to be need for debt relief. And interestingly, 20 something years ago, Ann Kruger tried to get this train out of the station and got derailed. Uh, going to 19th Street in the last few days, this stuff is back in the conversation now. It's permitted to talk right to the top now about debt distress, debt relief, and the sovereign debt reconstruction mechanism. And there are two papers in the Oxrep issue, one by two distinguished international lawyers about legal questions, and one by former student of mine now teaching in Sydney about the incentive compatibility issues in sovereign debt reconstruction. I recommend those two papers to you as the final thing that I will say. Now let me hand over, thank you all, to Paolo. Thank you, David, and good morning, uh, everyone. Thank you, Peterson and Adam, for your hospitality today. I will be briefer than, than David, and I will focus on a specific issue um, about our special issue. I think I lost the presentation here. Okay. Yeah, doesn't. Okay, thank you. Um, leadership. I must say, our first essay in the in the uh, special issue, written by uh, David and myself, finished with two large quotes from an article that Adam Posen wrote for uh, Foreign Affairs in 2017, which was, to me, was a, a really seminal way of thinking about leadership and the economy. So we can discuss a and. Uh, for, for a long time, what we need for good policies, but then the leadership is what makes everything stick. And so Adam was part of our project, and in fact, we concluded with quoting from his article, and again, is, uh, uh, we are delighted to be here. And I will start with my, uh, my short presentation with this quote from the Economic Consequences of the Peace by uh, Jomena Keynes which is a quite a strong and I find it, to some extent distressing uh, quote, but also it tells us about the world uh, in 2000, sorry, 1919, and there are also some links and um, uh, potential parallels, not quite happy parallels, with where we are today. So this is why do we need leadership and say, our special issue is all about these well-functioning, rules-based international economic systems, but it cannot stand on its own. In, in leadership is, is important because 
it's a way to minimize competition for markets and resources. Uh, it's a way to provide a framework for countries to really stick together and try to avoid this beggar your neighbor uh, situation that became uh, the norm in the 1930s. Um, leadership is also necessary to set the path for a new order, and that is particularly relevant for where we are today, and I will come to that in a, in a moment. And also, leadership needs to ensure that countries continue to work together, cooperate, and, uh, and keep the dialogue open to ensure that divisions and tensions do not remain entrenched. And I think, again, it is an important point for where we are today. And in the, time, in the times of crisis, leaders put together the backstop. And an example of this, although imperfect, was the, uh, lead, was the United States call for the G20 to get together in November, 20, November uh, 2008. So again, the G20 being upgraded to a leaders uh, forum in order to bust stock the, the crisis. But, sorry, I keep using this in the, wrongly. So what is the risk of no leadership? And, and I go back to the 1929, the crisis where there was no framework for countries to work together and prevent the contagion and, and everything else. And Charles Kindleberger says that that was due to the British inability and the US unwillingness to assume responsibility for stabilizing the global economic system. What was needed then is more or less what we identified as the four objectives for the G20. Um, and it was like a relatively open market for goods, a counter-cyclical uh, long-term lending, and then liquidity policy coordination. It didn't happen then. And uh, what happened, it was this beggar your neighbor policies and a, a, a series of bad uh, effects after that. So where we are now, in the, our special issues, and again, I don't go into all the, the very, uh, the, the excellent papers we have. I think we are in a sort of tangled leadership. We have the US that is now the reluctant leader so that means increasingly unwilling to underwrite the provision of economic stability and international security, but also is a reluctant hegemon that can become disruptive. And again, I, I, I like to draw your attention to Adam's uh, article in Foreign Affairs. So what happened when uh, uh, there is a disruptive leaders at the helm and what will that will lead to? Europe is in between, has always been in between. Uh, the very good uh, uh, essay by Klaus Regling and also by Pier Carlo Padova, uh, Paolo Guerrieri, and Giovanni Farese, they show very much why uh, Europe is, to some extent, a game changer because what has been done in Europe is so uh, different and important, you know, the ability to pull together these uh, countries into, a, first of all, a custom union, single market, and then in a monetary union. But it's obviously that makes that this leadership is in between, is sort of difficult to, to come up with. So I think the in between is a good description. And China is the game cha changer. It's where we are now is because of China. I know that our Chinese friend, and uh, either uh, Chow has just left because so, he has to go to another meeting, they quite dispute this, uh, the idea that China is a game changer. But the reality is the dynamics of the world economy has changed because of China. Um, so the uh, essay by Hai Hong Gao really stressed in a very, um, I would say, um, sound and critical way the role of China as a, as a game changer, and in particular in the monetary and financial system. So is that where we are? We look at this monetary system, which I call it sticky. Sticky because we like it or not, the dollars remains the glue, then the, 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 the force that glue the world economy together. I say we like it or we don't like it because there are many countries that are not comfortable anymore to have 
the dollars and the main, as the main glue of the world economy. But that's what we have. And there is no um, way to change, and no obvious way in the, I would say, medium term. And that it comes very, is very evident from our essays, uh, again, the managed convertibility of the renminbi, the renminbi means then he can be, he has a limited international use. Uh, even if the geopolitics have recently driven shift in the use and the holding of dollars, but these are very marginal. So again, we're not talking about uh, fundamental changes. And we spend, we have also a, a, a paper uh, by Ezra Prasad on digital currencies. And again, the question is, are digital currency going to change the international monetary system? And the answer is no. It, they will provide good tools, a good infrastructure, but they're not going to, to change the fundamental of the system. Um, I spend a few, if you allow me, spend just a few minutes to talk about the paper that I've written with Paul van der Noord. Is this work in progress? We look at the concept of exorbitant privilege. Uh, that was the, the label then uh, um, uh, Valerie Giscard d'Estaing uh, put on the dollar and the fact that the ability to uh, fund um, is a current account deficit by uh, the, running um, by capital inflows. But there's um, an aspect of this exorbitant privilege is the ability to run a larger fiscal space. Um, and so expansionary fiscal space when negative shocks uh, happen. And then we, we test this and we see that there is no adverse reaction of foreign, foreign lenders and no significant higher cost to borrowing. So we take a look at the uh, reserve currency issues by the G7 countries. We tested this and we see then the G7 have a larger fiscal space than other countries. And again, we use uh, this concept of fiscal space in a deliberately unusual way. Sorry, there's a typo there. So in fact, we look at the maximum public uh, debt to GDP that a country can sustain without a trigger and adverse reaction from foreign lenders and not generally all lenders. Um, I show you here uh, this, uh, uh, the result of our models. I don't go into the details, but I just say those two um, uh, points, D uh, line and D line two, are basically the level of equilibrium and, and the point after the threshold after which, and this is D2, uh, the debt will explode, will grow exponentially. And we tested, um, this is the baseline and on the, on the left-hand side, and we look at the increase reserve currency status that increase this fiscal space. So again, this tested, and the result, the empirical result, uh, we look at two episodes of crisis, one is the global financial crisis and the other one is COVID-19. And again, you can see uh, how the um, G7 countries could actually uh, have the, uh, significantly more fiscal space uh, debt uh, than um, other countries because of the reserve currency status. Um, as I said, this is work in progress and I really appreciate uh, comments if you have some and if you have the chance to read this paper. So this is the, uh, again, the international monetary system requ requires multilateral cooperation. This is the lessons and the conclusion from many of our papers. Why cooperation? Because uh, that is a way to ensure as a smooth functioning. Um, so, and that means a stronger multilateral financial safety net. We have a discussion in our issue, in our special issues of multilateral safety net versus bilateral swap agreements. Um, we need enhanced uh, cross-border cooperation between central banks and the regulators. And then we need calls or cooperation with regional financial arrangements. And again, this is something that many of the papers we have discussed. Once again, we are at the risk of monetary financial uh, fragmentation that will lead at, uh, to a zero-sum game. And an area, and the, David mentioned already, is sovereign debt. And the fragmentation around contracts, uh, creditors, uh, type of debts, type of creditors, and conditions 
which are making this debt resolution uh, and debt restructuring a much more difficult game. And the final point is about we need a stronger multilateral architecture. That comes very clearly from a Hai Hong, uh, Hai Hong Gao's paper. So China need to see that uh, um, there is a, 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 a reform in the governance of the multilateral uh, financial architecture. And I would add then the what we call by uh, innocent by standard or the second tier countries, uh, to use David's expression, they also would like to see a reform of this uh, architecture and in order to feel more comfortable in the current uh, economic order and financial order. So we need reforms to make the institutional framework more, more resilient vis-a-vis -vis the changing dynamics of the world economy. And when I talk about changing dynamics, I mean especially China and the large developing countries. And then the enhanced cooperation will actually lead and, and move forward an agenda whose main points, among others, are fiscal poli policies to stimulate demand and reduce excessive surpluses. Again, a, a significant discussion in our, um, in our uh, special issues about imbalances. Uh, regulations to contain financial instability. Again, we discuss at length the um, issue about capital flows and capital movement. An international tax framework to remove uh, uh, loopholes. Uh, an international green deal for environmental sustainability. And smart migration policy to mitigate the demographic imbalances in advanced economies. So we talk about these imbalances we don't, uh, we decided deliberately not to discuss the migration policies, but this is the next step. This is obviously the consequences of uh, uh, when we look at these uh, demographic imbalances. I stop here and I really leave uh, the floor to our, the other two uh, contributors. Um, I think that uh, you are the next one on the emerging market economies. Thank you. Very good morning to all of you. It is a great pleasure uh, to be back here again. I was here was about two weeks ago for the conference on the uh, 50 years, uh, fl floating exchange rate at 50. Now, uh, this morning, I would like to uh, talk about uh, our paper at the Oxrap entitled The uh, Impossibility of the the impossibility of the impossible trinity, the case of Indonesia. So let me let me uh, start by providing the background, the reasons why uh, we were writing this paper. Yeah, it was back 2008, 2008, 2009. I was at the uh, Ministry of Finance, working as special advisor to. Uh, then Minister of Finance Sri Mulyani at that time, and also a Sherpa for the uh, G20. Uh, I recall that after the uh, Chairman Bernanke at that time decided to do the quantitative easing, many emerging economies experienced uh, appreciation of the uh, currency quite significantly. Yeah, and then I became Finance Minister and I had to manage the taper tantrum 2013. What was happened was exactly the opposite of 2009-2010. I recall when I was a student, yeah, I was thought that you don't need to worry about this capital flows because in economics, we have the very famous Mandel Fleming models, the trilemma. But our experience when I was sitting as a policy makers shows something that this is easier to be said than done. So that's the reason why I decided to write this paper a sort of like a combination of this analytical and policy experience on that. Yeah, and 
as you can see here, the large capital flow disruptions create a significant challenge and issue for policymakers in emerging market and developing economies. And you can see in this Oxrep edition, there is a paper by Stephen Greenfield. Uh, he is a very nice paper on that. And our paper looks at Indonesia experience from 2009 uh, quantitative easing and 2013 taper tantrum. And the question is why Indonesian policymakers were unable to use policies as per the trilemma and the policy implication of this. I recall back on 2013, we had the limited breakfast meeting at the fund when I was uh, asked together with Governor Rajan at the time to explain the situation of the uh, emerging economies. We raised the concern about the implication of this monetary policy in the US to emerging economies. Yeah. And then uh, I remember there was a question from at the time, I think uh, it was the governor of the Central Bank of Mexico at the time, Augustin Carsten. He asked me a question why you are worried so much about this volatility of the exchange rate? Why don't you just use exchange rate as the shock absorber? That's exactly what we learned from the trilemma, right? The impossible trinity. So I'll, I'll explain about it later on. And I think this issue is particularly relevant today, especially with the interest rate hike in the US, even though the current situation is rather different for many emerging economies, because the current account deficit in emerging economies not as bad as 2013. And the reason behind it was because during the COVID, private saving increased. So many countries experience a very small current account deficit or even current account surplus. So the impact was relatively limited and communication is much better now compared to what we had 2013. So the question is, does the trilemma or impossible trinity work for Indonesia? And how can policymakers manage capital flows in the if the impossible trinity does not function as predicted? So I don't want to go into detail about it. Yeah, I believe that you are very familiar in this. I just want to uh, sort of like highlights about this, the trilemma we learn from the textbook. If we want to have this, we manage to have this exchange rate management. Yeah, then, you know, we have to, there are three, three uh, possible uh, policy options, but we have to choose two out of three here. Yeah, but it's very interesting about two weeks ago at the conference here in the Peterson Institute, I met Ellen, Ellen Ray. Yeah, and then her famous uh, paper about the dilemma it's very ring a bell to me. Uh, in her paper, she mentioned about the global financial cycle. And this is exactly our experience in Indonesia. Countries cannot fully insulate themselves from external shocks. Let me give an example in the case of Indonesia. If we let the exchange rate to appreciate due to the um, quantitative easing, what would happen at that time we would kill our export. At the same time, if we try to sterilize the capital inflow, the cost was very expensive because the spread between the Fed fund rate and Bank Indonesia rate. So not easy choice for policymakers at that time. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll explain to you. Of course, the question is, why don't we use the tightening the fiscal policy? If you recall that during the 2009, there was a commodity boom as well. And many emerging market, especially when there was a issue of when there is a, a commodity boom, many emerging market experience fiscal policy is pro-cyclical because the terms of trade effect. Yeah, and politically it's not easy as well. The second one, the importance of financial stability. Financial stability is crucial, but it may require sacrificing some degree of monetary policy independence because we cannot just, for example, like raise interest rate policy like what it was suggested by the fund back on 1998. At a time, if you recall, during the 1998, uh, interest rate was increased by around 
and as a result, many banks collapsed at that time. So we could not repeat that kind of uh, uh, policy. And the limit of exchange rate management, why don't we just use the exchange rate to become a shock absorber? Unlike many countries, unlike country like Australia, for example, we had a trauma because this 1998, every time the rupiah depreciate, then people start to think that the Asian financial crisis back. So there is an issue about this uh, uh, trauma. And don't forget about the issue of this exchange rate overshoot as well, as mentioned by, you know, ex uh, nicely by, by Rudiger Dornbus about the exchange rate overshoot. So because of that, uh, countries must consider a range of the policy option. Yeah, it's not enough only, uh, you know, imposing, implementing the uh, uh, trilemma. So, and that is a sort of like a framework for this. I don't want to go into detail about it, uh, but I think I would say that IMF compared to uh, back on 1998, in terms of this managing capital outflow, the few are quite different nowadays. Yeah, it's no, even capital control is no longer a taboo. Yeah, or capital flow management is there. If you, you can, I don't want to go into detail about it, but this is some of the policy options. If there is a, a capital inflows, we should lower the interest rate, et cetera, and the opposite. Yeah, but let me, let me now go to the Indonesian experience. Apologize for some of you that were here about two, two weeks ago. I used the same chart here, bear with me, but let me explain this BC uh, chart a little bit. The green line is a foreign reserve for Indonesia. So you can see when the Fed decided to do the quantitative easing, our foreign reserve increased quite substantially. Yeah. And the red uh, bar is the current account. So because of this increase of the capital inflows, the rupiah, which is the red line, started to appreciate. Interestingly, because of that, and also because the commodity super cycle, there was a sort of like an appreciation of the uh, currency in Indonesia. Then the current account started to move into deficit in 2012. Yeah. The response from the central bank at that time, because as I said, it's too expensive to, uh, you know, to stay the last, they started to intervene the forex market. At the same time, you could see that the foreign reserve started to decline at the same time because there was a capital outflow. Yeah, until Chairman Bernanke announced the so-called the tapering talk was May 2013. Yeah, his statement was very short, but the impact was very long on emerging uh, economies. He just said that we are preparing to end the quantitative easing. And as a result, after that, you know, exchange rate collapse in many emerging market, emerging economies. Indonesia was classified as part of the so-called the fragile five together with India, South Africa, Turkey, uh, Brazil, yeah. So you could see that the foreign reserve uh, declined. To anticipate this, prob the, this situation, what we did at that time, because uh, due to the huge current account deficit, um, we introduced the so-called uh, expenditure reducing policy and expenditure switching policy by cutting the government uh, budget, reducing the fuel subsidy, adjusted the fuel price for 45%. I mentioned in the seminar two weeks ago, after I decided to do it, adjusted the fuel price by 45%, I stopped reading local newspaper and local, you know, local TV for one, for one month because they criticize me every day. Um, but it worked, that kind of policy. And the central bank also introduced some uh, macro prudential policy. Yeah. So let me try to explain this. 
why it is difficult at that time, you know, to to implement the the impossible trinity because the option for Indonesia at that time we just let exchange rate to depreciate during the quantitative easing, let the exchange rate to appreciate, and during the uh, taper tantrum, let the exchange rate to depreciate. The first one is, thank you so much for uh, insightful comments from David. We discussed a lot on this issue when uh, we were preparing our paper. The first one is differing monetary policy objective. Because if you recall, this is back on the analytical framework. Um, we still, you know, we are quite familiar with the issue of this um, uh, external balance and also employment. In the case of the quantitative easing back on 2009, because the capital inflows in Indonesia, we were in the situation of this uh, current account surplus and also full employment. So when there was a capital inflow, analytically what the central bank should do is to lower the interest rate. But under this kind of situation, if you lower the interest rate, then it will propagate inflation. So there is a sort of like a difficulties under this kind of situation. Because if you're lowering the interest rate, you boost economic growth, but you're already in the full employment situation. Yeah, the opposite was true during the taper tantrum. Yeah, we are under deficit. Yeah, we are on the, on the, on the, on the current account uh, deficit. And then uh, not full employment. If we have to handle this uh, issue by raising interest rate, then it will kill economic growth. So there is a sort of like, um, you know, policy dilemma here. And the reason behind it is because differing monetary policy objective full employment and trade balance. In addition to that, Bank Indonesia, they cannot only focus simply to focus on inflation. Why? Because if the Fed raise the interest rate, like what happened now, Bank Indonesia do not respond to the increase of the Fed fund rate, then what will happen is capital outflow. Then it will trigger the second aspect, the volatile exchange rate. As I said, because the trauma due to the Asian financial crisis, there was always risk about this exchange rate uh, hysteresis, the overshoot, then create panics in the market. So somehow the government, the central bank need to intervene the forex market uh, on also introduce the macro potential. And in addition to that, the balance sheet effect. I think uh, Ashin's paper talk about the original scene. And this is not an easy thing as well because not all of the companies uh, has their portfolio. So if we let the exchange rate to depreciate, then there is a risk of the balance sheet effect. And to make things you know, more complicated about the role of fiscal policy, theoretically, um, I think Jonathan wrote a, a very nice uh, paper on this with Atish Ghosh about uh, you know, the role of the fiscal policy and Jonathan uh, mentioned about how difficult to implement the fiscal policy for the capital uh, uh, during the capital uh, inflow. And I experienced that. The reasons for emerging economies is there was a, when, the, when there was a capital inflow at the same time, the commodity super cycle, the fiscal policy become pro-cyclical especially in the case of Indonesia, because uh, 75, almost 60% of revenues come from natural resources. So when there is an oil boom, the government revenue increase. At the same time, you know, because this government revenue increase, the burden of the fuel subsidy also increase. So making this fiscal policy become pro-cyclical. In fact, theoretically, what we should do when there was a capital inflow, we should tighten the fiscal. But because the fiscal policy is procyclical, very difficult to implement this. Yeah. Uh, the second aspect is distributional effect on commodity super cycle. Because the commodity super cycle, then there are two camps or two group of uh, in the economy. The one who take the benefit from this uh, commodity super cycle, then like a coal producer, etc., etc. But also, but on the opposite. 
the vulnerable groups because they are affected by this energy crisis. So this issue will have an impact on the income redistribution. We decided at that time to adjust to reduce the fuel subsidy, adjusted the fuel price, and did the cash transfer directly giving the money to the poor people. So all of this are beyond the monetary policy. So you cannot really implement the monetary policy like discussed in the trilemma because the role of commodity supercycle become making fiscal policy and procyclical. At the same time, there is a distributional effect, income redistribution, and we cannot address this issue simply by uh, monetary policy. So what we need is a mix of monetary policy, macro prudential policy, and fiscal policies become essentials. So one thing that I learned from this experience, I'm humbled by the reality that uh, the uh, impossible trinity might work, but maybe not easy. There is a cost of it. So what in the future that we need to think about the capital flow management. But I understand we need to be very careful on this. Yeah, I don't really have a sort of like an, a clear answer at this moment, but certainly be happy to have a discussion on that. One thing that I would like to mention on this is maybe some of the policies what I call, uh, because Indonesia adopted the open capital account, so there is no way we can impose the capital control because every time if we want to impose capital control, we need to go to the parliament before we finish the discussion, the capital already leave the country, right? So, so what we did at that time during the 2013, I introduced what I call the reverse Tobin tax. So if companies, foreign national, the multinational companies, did not repatriate their profit, then we give them a tax break to make sure that the capital stays in the country. So I call it the reverse Tobin tax. That kind of model, if people want to borrow money, maybe for the short term, maybe 20%, they need to lock up in the central bank for one year, we can discuss about it. But one thing that I would like, before I conclude my presentation, one thing is very important that I would like to highlight is the importance of the role of institution. If we have a credible institution, then maybe the role of the capital flow management will be relatively limited. But this is not easy. Yeah, because if you want to, if you talk about the good quality of institution, this will require good investment climate. When I was in the cabinet, I always said to my colleague, one of the reasons of why many Indonesians become religious was because they have to deal with the government. I mean, so many uncertainties, a lot of issues. If you want to ask for license, it's like a black hole. You never know what would happen until one day the government kindly uh, tell you that your investment already approved. There's nothing you can do except pray to God. So that is why we become uh, religious. But this will take some time. Yeah. And of course, uh, uh, this would be the, my, 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 my last uh, 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 remarks. Current account deficit, it shouldn't be a problem if it is financed by the foreign direct investment because it's more stable. Yeah, and this improvement of the investment climate is needed. I think I'll leave it up here. Thank you very much. Great. Well, uh, it's, uh, it's wonderful to be back at the Peterson Institute, and uh, sincere thanks to Adam uh, and to the Institute for hosting us. And uh, my thanks uh, also to uh, Paula and David for their uh, wonderful co-editorship of this uh, volume, uh, and my uh, gratitude to David uh, for all the discussions uh, these many months uh, on, on what I'm about to, uh, to talk about. Um, uh, Dede's uh, speech was uh, absolutely wonderful, and it's, um, it was brilliant, it was uh, so insightful, and um, uh, my hope is to get uh, one one-hundredth of, uh, of the insights across, but it's on the same theme 
uh, as uh, Dede was talking about. Okay, so um, uh, one of the things that uh, David and I discussed uh, many times in the past few weeks is it's always a good idea to start with Keynes. Um, and uh, that's what I'm doing. Uh, and this is, uh, this quote by Keynes uh, gives his uh, mindset uh, in the early 40s, three years before the Bretton Woods uh, 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 conference. Uh, and it's, it's similar to uh, uh, some of the points that uh, Paula and David put up uh, uh, in respect of the discussion between uh, Mead and, and Keynes uh, in the early 40s. Uh, but what is clear uh, from this quote uh, is that Keynes uh, firmly believed uh, that it would be necessary uh, in the post-war architecture uh, to regulate capital flows. Um, uh, he didn't get, of course, precisely what he wanted at Bretton Woods. Uh, he didn't get that capital, uh, capital flows should be regulated and would be regulated per the rules. Uh, but at least he got, as, as I'll show you in a second, uh, that countries had the freedom uh, to so regulate uh, capital movements uh, to suit their own uh, 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 macro objectives. Um, and. Uh, it's important to understand, uh, you know, uh, how different uh, this was from the perspective uh, in the interwar period. Uh, and I put um, uh, a nice quote uh, from the Genoa conference uh, from the 20s, which was obviously uh, the opposite of what Keynes was saying about the need uh, to regulate capital flows in the 1940s. Uh, and I think uh, the rationale that Keynes had for his position is completely fresh uh, today. Uh, it's the same uh, rationale uh, that I think um, uh, uh, was put up by David Vines in those three or four uh, points about what the uh, international monetary system uh, needs to accomplish if it's going to be an effective system. Uh, and it's basically that um, uh, without some uh, regulation of capital flows, especially for an emerging market country, um, uh, there is a lack of uh, macro policy autonomy. Uh, and this was a lesson uh, from the interwar period uh, that was, uh, you know, front of mind for Keynes, uh, that you will need uh, some regulation of uh, international capital movements uh, in order uh, to protect and to underpin uh, macro policy uh, autonomy uh, 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 going forward. Um, and, you know, uh, Keynes was not the only uh, person uh, uh, in, in sort of who had in his mind uh, that uh, volatile capital movements uh, had the potential to be uh, very destructive. Uh, you had mainstream uh, Harvard academics like Frank Tossig uh, saying uh, uh, similar things about uh, the havoc that volatile capital uh, flows uh, can engender. Um, uh, and you had uh, the uh, head of the Federal Reserve, the U.S. Central Bank, um, suggesting uh, much the same thing, uh, that volatile capital uh, flows may, um, uh, may undercut uh, free trade uh, and may cause uh, all sorts of macroeconomic challenges, uh, and so casting doubt on the wisdom uh, of a system uh, with unfettered uh, cross-border capital flows. Uh, and so, uh, at Bretton Woods, uh, and I said that Keynes didn't get precisely uh, what he wanted, uh, but he got not that uh, capital flows should uh, be regulated and would uh, be regulated per the rules, uh, but he got uh, in Article 6 uh, that members uh, could uh, regulate cross-border flows uh, uh, to suit their individual objectives. Uh, did they have uh, complete carte blanche? No. Uh, they didn't have complete carte blanche. Um, they were subject uh, to the requirement in Article 4 uh, that countries' policies uh, should not uh, give rise to beggar thy neighbor uh, behavior. Uh, again, a point uh, that both Paula uh, and David made in their uh, in their presentations. Uh, 
I think Article 6 and Article 4 taken together, uh, to me, uh, delineate uh, what the IMF's role uh, should be uh, in uh, advising countries uh, on uh, how they should uh, manage uh, cross-border flows. Uh, it, it gives kind of the perimeter uh, of what the fund's role uh, is uh, in the Charter. Um, you know, and uh, that vision, I think, uh, was uh, the way the world worked, worked uh, for three decades uh, until the collapse uh, of Bretton Woods. Uh, there were pervasive capital controls uh, by the main uh, industrial countries uh, in those uh, three decades. Um, uh, in fact, uh, if you look, um, uh, capital movements uh, uh, across the industrial world were actually more restrictive uh, than for many uh, what we call emerging markets uh, today. Um, and it's, it, I think it's important also to know that the vision in the IMF Charter was very, very different, couldn't be more different uh, from the vision uh, in another uh, international institution, namely the OECD, uh, uh, which was championing uh, 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 full liberalization uh, of, uh, of capital movements, uh, initially uh, exempting uh, uh, short-term movements, uh, but ultimately uh, endorsing full capital mobility uh, as the true North Star, uh, as a senior official uh, at the OECD once put to me, uh, guiding uh, policy in this area. Um, now, the world, uh, as I said, this, this world uh, survived for a few decades, um, uh, but the position uh, of uh, the most important country in the system uh, changed very markedly uh, in the early 70s. Um, and uh, the interpretation that uh, I offer uh, here, uh, and this is the argument we make in, uh, in our book on capital flows with uh, Rex Ghosh that Dede kindly mentioned and uh, Mabash Qureshi, uh, is that the changed uh, U.S. position was uh, at its core opportunistic. Uh, the U.S. dollar uh, needed uh, to depreciate, um, and um, uh, the negotiations uh, with Europe and Japan, uh, which would need to appreciate, whose currencies would need to appreciate, was very fraught. Uh, and so uh, the U.S. came to the conclusion that uh, the uh, path of least resistance uh, to bring about uh, the reconfiguration of exchange rates uh, was to get rid of capital controls. Uh, money would flow out of the U.S. Uh, and the problem uh, would be solved. And so, uh, you know, there is this uh, statement in the economic report of the president uh, in 1973 uh, that basically says uh, we, should, uh, we, should, we should and the world should uh, dump uh, capital controls. Um, the U.S. didn't uh, stop there. Uh, it didn't stop with what it said uh, in, it, in the economic report of the president in 73. Uh, the U.S. managed to insert in uh, the IMF charter a, 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 I think, a fundamental uh, change in Article 4 uh, in the amendment of 78. Uh, Keynes, had, Keynes and White had very carefully crafted uh, Article 4 to say uh, that uh, the fundamental purpose of the IMS uh, was uh, inter alia to uh, safeguard uh, international trade. Uh, and it was very clear uh, that a fundamental purpose uh, of the IMS uh, in the Charter and in the view of Keynes and White uh, was not uh, to foster uh, cross-border trade in assets. It was not to foster um, uh, free capital mobility. But in the 78 Amendment, um, uh, the U.S. managed to insert uh, the idea uh, that the fundamental purpose of the IMS is to facilitate free trade both in goods uh, and in capital. So that's, that's quite a big difference uh, from the vision uh, in 1944. And it's at a time uh, when other industrial countries are still uh, using capital controls. 
But, but the world was going to change uh, uh, very, uh, very fast and uh, uh, very fundamentally uh, in the course of the next decade. Uh, one, one key country that switched camp, uh, camps uh, pretty early, um, uh, having been a, an ardent supported, supporter of regulated capital movements, uh, but uh, abandoned that position, was France. Uh, uh, under the Mitterrand uh, uh, presidency, uh, there was uh, after uh, the, the first uh, part of that uh, of his term, uh, there was this so-called tournant de la rigueur and the Francfort policy, um, uh, and uh, France abandoned uh, its traditional support uh, for uh, for capital controls. Uh, there was uh, movements uh, within Europe, uh, especially uh, the EC directive championed by uh, Jacques Delors uh, for free capital mobility. Uh, there was the dismantling of capital controls uh, by Margaret Thatcher. Uh, there was uh, the Washington Consensus, and we can talk about whether uh, the Washington Consensus says something very specific about uh, capital mobility. Uh, there was Larry Summers' uh, point that we know of no better way uh, uh, to discipline uh, economic policies uh, than to have uh, open capital, uh, uh, capital flows. And uh, this, uh, this changing perspective in the industrial countries uh, had big consequences uh, for the emerging market countries. They listened to all this. Uh, and many of them dismantled uh, what had been a wide array of prudential capital controls. Uh, and the uh, result was a series of uh, boom-bust uh, uh, capital flow cycles uh, that affected emerging market countries. Uh, and uh, the consequence was, is well summed up uh, by, the, uh, by the famous quote of Diaz Alejandro, uh, which is, goodbye financial repression, uh, hello financial crash. Okay, um, what I want to uh, then uh, argue is that uh, essentially I don't see a lot of institutional leadership uh, by the IMF uh, in this period saying, whoa, well, maybe this is a problem. Maybe, uh, maybe it's not a great idea uh, for emerging markets uh, to sweep away uh, prudential capital controls. Uh, I don't. I don't, I, I, I think that's kind of shocking. I also think um, that, you know, there's nothing really about, that's interpretive of, about the IMF charter uh, that says uh, emerging markets or countries in general uh, may avail themselves of uh, capital flow regulation. Uh, there's not much guidance uh, institutionally by the fund uh, in this period, uh, which is a, which is a, a formative period for uh, for what comes in the in the subsequent decades. Until, be careful what you wish for. Uh, until uh, the IMF does decide to provide leadership, uh, and around the time of the 50th anniversary of the IMF, uh, the managing director of the IMF decides uh, that our signature uh, initiative for, uh, I say R, I'm no longer employed by the IMF. The IMF's signature uh, initiative for the 50th anniversary will be to amend uh, the articles, the amend uh, the IMF charter, change uh, uh, Article 6 uh, in the direction of uh, uh, having free capital uh, movements uh, as the uh, uh, desirable end goal uh, for all countries. Uh, and uh, uh, the requirement uh, that uh, member countries will need to seek IMF permission uh, if they want uh, to put on capital account regulations. Uh, and uh, Michel Condessu was very influenced. I mentioned uh, uh, the Delors, uh, I mentioned um, uh, the, the, the Mitterrand uh, presidency, um, uh, and he was, he was very influenced uh, by the experience in France, and he interpreted it in the way uh, uh, that I write down from uh, a quote from uh, him in the middle of this slide, which is that uh, essentially capital controls don't work. Uh, he also added they hurt the poor more than the rich. 
Um, uh, and so uh, we, we went forward, the IMF went forward um, uh, to try and amend uh, the, uh, the articles. Uh, and uh, at our annual meetings uh, in, uh, in Madrid, uh, there was the Madrid uh, Declaration, which uh, said that um, you know, countries should get rid of, uh, of capital controls. And we all know how this played out. Uh, it wasn't for uh, lack of trying uh, by the institution uh, that derailed this. Uh, what derailed it was the Asian financial crisis. Uh, and ultimately, as a, as a legal matter, what derailed it was uh, that the U.S. Congress uh, ordered uh, the Treasury to withdraw its support uh, for the proposed amendment. Uh, and notwithstanding the continued support by the Europeans, the withdrawal uh, of the U.S. here uh, killed, uh, killed this initiative. Um, so uh, what is interesting beyond that, uh, that uh, point is that even having lost uh, the battle uh, to amend the articles, essentially the fund continued exactly, exactly uh, as it would have done uh, had it had a legal, uh, a legal basis uh, to, to proceed in that direction. Uh, I'll, I'll explain that in a second. Uh, but really, what, what, was, what was the main uh, thing that the fund uh, should have been thinking about uh, in the aftermath of this debacle? Uh, and in the aftermath of the Asian financial crisis. I think what it should have been thinking about is actually putting some flesh uh, on uh, Article 6, which is saying, Article 6 says, you may do these capital count regulations. I think what the fund should have been thinking about is, well, what kind of regulations uh, are needed to manage capital flow volatility uh, in emerging market countries. Fund did not do that. Uh, the fund did something else, which I don't have time to go into, but the fact that it didn't do it uh, was not lost on fund watchers. The independent evaluation office, who, which was looking at fund surveillance, basically concluded um, uh, that, you know, there was, a, there was a sort of set of informal uh, 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 policy advice that was given in the context of surveillance, which uh, essentially involved using fiscal policy, uh, which Dede mentioned is not that easy to do, uh, and in fact is rarely used uh, as the paper that Dede mentioned, uh, of, of, uh, co-authored by me, um, uh, 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 makes clear empirically fiscal policy is not used. And just allow your exchange rate to float. It's the shock absorber. That is said in every single report uh, 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 that the, the, these 19 cases uh, that the, uh, the IMF's IEO uh, uh, surveyed. So, okay, we lost the legal battle, but the uh, successor to Michel Condessu basically had the same view uh, as, uh, as Condessu, uh, and he, he says, I can think of no conditions under which capital controls, capital account regulations, would be beneficial for a country that imposes them. Okay, so the institutional, that's the voice of the institution, uh, and it's saying uh, essentially that um, uh, capital account regulation is not something that we're in favor of. Um, uh, free capital mobility is what we stand for. And so I conclude that uh, for uh, a half a century uh, after 1944, uh, the fund either doesn't provide leadership on capital account regulations or uh, the leadership it provides is to uh, go for full capital mobility. Um, there is a, a big change uh, during the global financial crisis. Dede uh, mentioned how the fund had become more open uh, to capital account regulations. Um, and uh, there was a process. Basically, a new managing director, Dominique Strauss-Kahn, uh, uh, took over. Uh, and he was uh, very, uh, very receptive to the position uh, of emerging market countries uh, faced with the monetary tsunami uh, 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 unleashed by uh, monetary uh, uh, policy in the United States. He was receptive to the fact uh, that uh, emerging market countries needed more tools uh, to contend uh, with capital flow volatility. Uh, he set in place a process within the fund uh, to try and come up uh, with some new recommendations. 
uh, and this uh, board paper called the IMF's Institutional View uh, uh, used the result of that research uh, and formulated uh, a, a new set of uh, guidance uh, for, uh, for fund policy uh, on, this, uh, on this issue. Um, uh, the problem was um, uh, he, he, we all know, uh, he left the fund and, uh, and did not see this through. Um, and the implementation uh, of, uh, of the policy in the, uh, in the 2012 board paper, uh, I think there was, a, there was a lot of wiggle room about how this policy was going to be implemented. At one end of the spectrum, uh, the emerging market countries uh, would have seen uh, uh, destigmatized uh, a rich array of tools uh, that might have been useful for, uh, for managing capital flow volatility. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, it would be essentially business as usual. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm almost done, um, but I, I want to say that um, uh, some emerging market countries were, in my view, rightly deeply suspicious uh, of the process that the fund was engaged in, uh, in uh, updating its guidelines uh, on, uh, on how countries should manage capital, uh, capital flow volatility. In particular, uh, some emerging market countries were of the view uh, that really the, the true agenda of the fund uh, was not to destigmatize uh, the uh, tools uh, that some emerging market countries were hungering for, um, uh, but rather to stigmatize them. Uh, in other words, uh, as a legal matter, uh, uh, countries had uh, a lot of flexibility under the IMF's charter uh, to, uh, to use tools. Uh, and so if the institutional view was uh, uh, going to set out, as it did, a, a set of highly restrictive conditions under which uh, particular tools might be used, uh, then it was really going to end up as stigmatizing those tools, those tools rather than uh, destigmatizing them. Um, uh, you know, uh, the fund made some progress uh, last year uh, in trying to remedy uh, some of the stigma uh, associated uh, with the use of capital account regulations, notably by allowing preemptive use of these tools, which was a, a, a big ask uh, of emerging market countries um, uh, outside of surges, uh, and that is, uh, that is progress. But there was so much uh, that was uh, left unaddressed in the revised uh, paper of 2022, notably, um, you know, just clearly delineating uh, the, the latitude that emerging market countries have under the charter, uh, except uh, when it conflicts uh, with Article 4, that seems to me uh, a, a brilliant innovation uh, by Keynes and White, one that is, uh, holds water today, uh, and there was a perfect opportunity uh, in 2022 to circumscribe uh, when the fund would pronounce on the wisdom uh, of a capital account regulation. When the fund pronounces uh, that uh, uh, inflow controls by uh, a small Australian t state, Tasmania, on uh, foreign inflows into its uh, real estate m market in Hobart, and says that's uh, that's not good. Um, uh, that is uh, that is overreach. Uh, last slide. Uh, I think the Keynes White vision um, uh, is uh, very current. Uh, it's been ignored by the fund uh, since the 70s. Uh, I think, uh, you know, the history shows that when there was institutional leadership, it was in a certain direction uh, and contrary, I think, to the Keynes-White vision. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, if I had to explain it, I think ultimately the IMF is pro-free capital uh, movements, just as the OECD. Uh, and uh, uh, where we are on this issue reflects uh, that, uh, that ideological bias. Let me stop there. Let me thank the other three th speakers for what they have said, you have all said. Uh, I think that together they've opened up a, a really large opportunity for questions. 
Let me put this to you all that we are now at 11.40 and we'll be having question and answer and run that for a quarter of an hour or 20 minutes maximum. Uh, can I first of all ask for any questions from any of you in the audience? Thank, thank you very much, uh, Adam. Yes, please, let's all do that. First question, can you hear me still here? Yeah. Yeah, can you hear me? Very good. And there's a microphone for you to use standing there. Uh, anyone who'd like to join in the queue for questions, please do, or there will be a microphone brought around to you by Jessica. Please, could you say in just one sentence who you are and then please ask your question and I will field it to whoever is appropriate to deal with it. Thank you. Sure, uh, I'm Joe Gagnon, a senior fellow here at, at Peterson. Um, a question for Jonathan and a question for Dede. Um, uh, and I guess the first question is maybe for the David, Paula, and Jonathan. But um, I, I like the the talk about the the goals of of a better system uh, that you talked about, um, and it was interesting the balanced, strong, sustainable growth. And it was interesting that you showed fiscal space seemed to be related to being a reserve currency status. I get the desire to uh, worry about private capital flows that could swamp a country and how to, how to deal with that. Uh, but one thing, if you are worried about imbalances, it seems to me you shouldn't also you should not forget the role of what governments do. It's not just private capital flows. I mean, for the largest uh, current account surpluses and the largest current account deficit, it's almost all uh, at least three quarters what governments are doing, not what the private sector is doing. So I think that's worth discussing uh, in your in your uh, book. The uh, and you may have Jonathan especially may have a comment on that. For Day Day, I didn't understand the the sequence you said. It didn't make sense to me. I may have missed something, but you, a capital inflow into Indonesia, which pushes up the rupiah, tends to reduce exports and lower the current account surplus. And you said the traditional response to that should be to lower interest rates, uh, which I think is right. Then you said that problem with that is it's inflationary. Well, if you have a strong currency and, and you're weakening your economy from lower exports, isn't that deflationary? So isn't that what you want? Is a lower interest rate to fight the deflationary pressures, or did I miss something? Thank you very much, Dede. Can you take that specific question first, please? Thank you very much. Uh, uh, sorry I, if I didn't did not make it uh, very clear. Yeah, uh, in 2000, 2009, when there was a capital inflow to uh, Indonesia. The response from Bank Indonesia, exactly like what I said, was lowering the exchange rate. But at that time, we were on the interest, situation. Interest rate. So, sorry, lowering, lowering, lowering interest. Sorry, lowering interest rate, not exchange Actually, rate. Yeah. Lowering interest rate. But at that time, we were in the situation of this full employment. So what happened after the quantitative easing? The economic growth increased quite substantially and also propelled by this you know, expansionary of the monetary policy. Then it created a problem of the current account deficit after that. Yeah. So the, the situation is become pro-cyclical, both for monetary and fiscal. Similar situation happened during the uh, taper tantrum, the 2013, we were in a deficit and unemployment what the government and central bank did at that time. We raised the interest rate, we introduced the um, expenditure reducing policy, and the impact is also cyclical. So that is why my point is, sorry if I did not make it clearly, probably we cannot only simply rely on this monetary policy to address this issue. Somehow we need this macro prudential. I hope I answer your question. Thank, thanks, Dede. Let me just 
ask you that, uh, say one further thing to that, refer you to Olivia Blanchard's piece, which he wrote soon after leaving the fund. Uh, two targets, current uh, full employment and current account, one instrument, you can never do two with one. Uh, that's a, a, a collapsed, simple version of this claim that Dead is making, and I think it's helpful to look at Olivier's piece to get a grip on that. You asked another question, which was about the role of government. So let me talk to you in one few sentences about my own country, Australia. <clears throat> 2012 collapse of the China boom. What's Australia got to do? Uh, I'm not going to give you an answer to that question, but here's the discussion. This is also a time with a very large overhang of public debt after the global financial crisis, and a country set on austerity, uh, fiscal cuts 1% per annum, uh, at a time when export demand collapsed. Uh, and there are two views looking back at the experience in Australia. Should the fiscal austerity have been postponed in order to sustain demand, or was the need for a country like Australia to bring discipline to the public sector debt numbers overridingly important? That's a conversation that you need to have, and I'm simply echoing your question and putting it in another way. You can't think about these current account imbalances that I was talking about without agreeing with your question that you need to think about fiscal right at the beginning when you're thinking about what to do. I think we've answered both of your questions. Is that right? Yeah, thank you. Okay, next question, please. Hi, I'm Steve Kamen from the uh, American Enterprise Institute. Um, actually, my question also involves government. Um, so if we look at the last decade, super low interest rates around the world led to heavy capital flows to emerging markets, large increases in debt. Now, with the Fed raising interest rates so much, it should be a perfect uh, uh, recipe uh, for a lot of distress in emerging markets. But the major emerging markets are doing okay, and they're weathering the storm pretty well, including uh, their corporates and private entities. The real problems that are being developed right now are among uh, frontier markets and lower income countries, and most of the debt there is by their government, okay? And so if we're thinking about a capital flow regime that will kind of resist the boom-bust cycle, uh, will this apply to government borrowing too? How will that work? I think you're the right person, first of all, uh, Jonathan, to have a go at that question. We'll, we'll ask Dede in a minute as well. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, nice to see you, Stephen. And, um, uh, and uh, you know, I, I, I don't have a lot uh, to say on this. Um, I didn't. I didn't talk uh, about that specific issue. Uh, I don't. You know, this. You you've uh, made the point that you know uh, private capital flows don't seem to be destabilizing uh, countries. Uh, so maybe balance sheet effects and so forth have, uh, are better managed uh, than they were in the past. Um, uh, yeah, I, 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 I don't really have uh, a, a lot to say. So, so yeah, maybe I'll just stop there. Dede, do you want to say anything about that? Yeah, perhaps my response is more on the, rather than the frontier economy and, you know, lower uh, income countries, is more on the emerging economies. I am a little bit skeptical on this for two reasons. Yeah, because if you recall in the situation back on 2013, the taper tantrum, the reason behind it, uh, one of the most important issue was a huge current account deficit in the so-called the fragile five. The question is why the taper tantrum 2.0 does not happen, I will say, because most of the emerging economies now running a current account surplus or very small current account deficit. And the reason behind it was because COVID. You know, most of the emerging economies, their private saving increased quite substantially due to the COVID. Mm. Mm. That's the first one. The second one, because this geopolitical tension, Russia and Ukraine, look at the energy and commodity prices. 
So there is a terms of trade effect. So they are running surplus because of that. The question is, what what would happen? What will happen after this? When the emerging market start to grow, the current account deficit start to increase yeah. and declining commodity prices, then we may repeat the situation like taper tantrum 2013. So this is the thing that we have to concern about. That is why I propose it is important to think about this um, mixed policy uh, using fiscal, monetary, and also macro prudential, and also capital flow management. Thanks very much. And, no, uh, up to you, please. Hi, Tam Bayumi, visiting scholar, King's College London, uh, in DC, DC at present. Um, it's always, in the end, the conversation seems to be very much about capital surges and how to uh, solve them. It's always struck me that one of the things you could do is have a dynamic capital uh, 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 rules in terms of the capital buffers, where when you get a large flow, and this is not limited to international flows, within the financial system to a particular group of, uh, of institutions, you simply raise their capital requirements. Uh, the big problem with capital flows is to work out whether they are genuine or due to fundamentals or uh, in some way sort of being uh, um, uh, being driven by other factors such as regulatory controls or whatever. And it seems to me that if you raise the cost to the recipients of holding this money, this is not a bad way to uh, try and try and sort out which uh, which one it is. Anyway, so there's the thought. And just to ask you, Jonathan, isn't that the idea of your reverse Tobin tax? Uh, have I connected those two ideas? No, um, and I beg pardon, Daddy. Yes. Yeah, which is true, but again, um, the, the reasons why, let me repeat, the reasons why we introduced what I call the reverse Tobin tax, yeah, at a time in the case of Indonesia, because we adopted the open capital account regime and we don't have much uh, uh, policy choices available, yeah, at a time. And that's why, you know, we, 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 we introduced the so-called the reverse Tobin tax in order to make sure that at least the capital stay longer yeah, in the country to minimize the destabilize due to the short-term uh, capital inflow. I don't know whether I really answered so, this question. So here we're talking a, a price mechanism rather than a, a physical restriction of controls. And it seems that the two of you come together at, in thinking that this might be a good way to go from many circumstances. Yeah, please. Eliodoro Temprano, I'm an advisor in the GX thing in the European Commission. Just wanted to react to the very interesting presentation by Professor Ostry, because I think what the European Union does is also important, right? It includes some of the most important countries in the world in terms of certain capital flows. Until recently, it included uh, the, the UK. Uh, and in 1988, it adopted this directive uh, on the liberalization of capital flows, which obliges EU countries not only to liberalize flows among themselves, but erga omnes. So this is very important because it is an important constraint and element in the international debate on how to regulate or not international capital flows. This directive, which I understand has been subsequently enshrined in the, in the EU treaties, is, is an important factor. No? So I, I just wanted to, to make that point. Um, but I mean, I fully share the fact that in designing the future international monetary system, what we do about capital flows is essential. So it's very relevant that this is included in this, in this uh, conference. Thank you very much. Can I just, that, I think that's not a question, but a comment, is that right? That's right, yeah, I think yeah. so, but yeah. I, I, we welcome your reactions, of yeah. course. Um, let me just add to that comment that I thought what Jonathan uh, said to us today was interesting in the following sense, that it gave a stronger historical backdrop to the remarks that he made in what he wrote for us. And I think it's uh, uh, helpful for all of you who just listened to today 
to go back to look or, or to go to the piece that he's written for us and see a step by step, day by day, what to do about particular circumstances discussion. Uh, it was helpful to have uh, a back, background framework to that discussion in the remarks today, and these two things fit together. Uh, any more to say about this? Just one, I, I completely agree with your point, and uh, I didn't have time. I had a slide on on the European, uh, your your point exactly, and their perspective, and 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 its role in the in the broader scheme of things. I did, just didn't have time to talk about it, but I completely agree. Thanks, Klaus. Question, please. Yes, thank you, um, Klaus Reikling, formerly ESM. As we are now no long question mode, but in comment mode, I wanted to make one, <laughs> one comment. Please. Um, um, we have discussed important changes in the international monetary system, but I think looking at um, the currencies, Euro, Renminbi, that are moving up, um, and we may be moving towards the multipolar system um, over time, it's a long-term process, I think deserves a little bit more more attention. Paola said the shifts are marginal. I think that's not quite right, particularly when I look at the renminbi. Um, and that's based, unfortunately, on the situation we are in since February last year um, with the war in Ukraine, um, the sanctions on Russia, um, um, the freezing of, of Russian foreign exchange reserves. I think they are giving an extra push to the move away from the dollar, which we have seen for some time. Um, China, the Chinese government is actively pushing to strengthen the international role of the renminbi, and they are quite successful, coming from a very low level. Um, but looking at the most recent SWIFT numbers, they doubled their share um, over the last um, 12 months. And we know that the Chinese government is working very actively with all its neighbors in China but also with the other BRIC countries, with um, oil exporters like Saudi Arabia on using the renminbi. And they are quite successful. And President Lula, who is in Beijing right now, has already agreed also to de denominate some of their trade in renminbi. Um, there is a shift here. And with the conflict between the US and China, um, if we are moving to something that some have called another Cold War, um, I think this shift will continue. We have one paper on, on the renminbi in the, in the volume, and that's very useful by Hai Yong Gao. My own contributions on the euro, it gives all the numbers how the importance of the, the euro has been developing over the last 20 years. It's a slow process, but it's visible in certain areas quite clearly. And I think this is really a structural shift in the international monetary system um, that can continue and would have a big impact, and it could have a positive impact, particularly on emerging markets, um, because it would then offer an opportunity not to only um, run debt in one currency. If we had had the multipolar system in the 80s or 90s, the Latin American debt crisis and the Asian debt crisis would have played out very differently. Thanks. And I think that, um, Can I? please, Paula. Uh, just a quick remark on what Klaus said, and I know we are running out of time. I don't believe, I mean, data are very clear. The renminbi remains a marginal currency, and SWIFT data for February has been a very, very a, a steep increase, but the numbers are still very, very low. And uh, the thing is, the problem is a problem of leadership, and the dollar remains the key currency. Then the renminbi is used on the margins. There is, an, back to the Russian uh, issue, there is a swap agreement between the People's Bank of China and the Russian Central Bank. But the amount is, is tiny compared to the reserving dollars which are now frozen. So, but that doesn't mean, the, and the renminbi is a regional currency, but there is now the Chinese, because of the capital control, in fact, it's very interesting that we talk about developing countries, but China did completely, and is doing a completely different macro management of the capital flows, inflows in particular. Um, but there isn't, uh, it's something we need to watch. It would be very bumpy and difficult, but at the moment, the numbers are still very, very low. To just add one sentence that 
these leadership issues are on the table um, in the way that Klaus has raised, um, what we need is a framework for thinking about these leadership issues. And that's the next question that we all need, I think, to turn to. That's three sentences. Thank you, David. Um, so on behalf of the Peterson Institute, let me thank our audience in person that was very engaged and provided excellent questions. Our audience globally, which in repeat viewings of this video should be aware of the issues being raised, and the authors and editors of the new issue of the Oxford Review of Economic Policy on International Monetary Reform, David Vines, Paolo Sabacci, Dede Basri, and Jonathan Ostry. Um, as well as the many other contributing authors, including Klaus Regling, Barry Eichengreen, and various people mentioned. I urge you to read it. The link is available on the website along with today's video. With that, I will just advertise the next uh, event of Macro Week here at the Peterson Institute. Um, the penultimate event and a highlight will be uh, Professor Dr. Joachim Nagel, the president of the Deutsche Bundesbank, will be giving a speech here at 2.15. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think on behalf of all of us, we should say thank you to, again to you, Adam, for having us here today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.